Okay. So now we're going to talk about wind. We're not going to talk about the large scale winds, but we're just going to talk about what creates winds, whether winds are small or large. Okay. But in order to talk about wind, we need to talk more about air pressure. So air pressure is one of the things we talked about in Unit 1, the idea that when you climb a mountain, the air gets thinner. And actually, that's kind of being shown here. When you climb a mountain, the air gets thinner. Okay, kind of calm the air. Um, so you can kind of think as basically, if you are a little person down there, okay, well, you can think of it in two ways. Okay, if you are a little person down here, not drawn to scale because you'd be even smaller than that, if this is to the top of the atmosphere and this is the basically where the earth starts down here. Um, you actually, the air is thicker, so the fact that all gases exert a pressure, over here your gas particles, there are a lot of them, and they are banging a lot, you know, banging on all directions, including the direction of you. So the air down here exerts a pressure against us. Um, the other thing we can kind of think of is basically kind of gravity Kind of, an, a, kind of an a culmination, a culmination of basically gravity um, making all those gases uh, exert a pressure collectively. Now, um, you see this down here, okay, 14.7 pounds per square inch. So the reason I was late, because I was kind of gathering a few things. So 14.7 pounds. I Googled it and I said convert 14.7 pounds to kilograms and it came up with about 6.6 .6 kilograms. So, because I don't have pounds. Okay. So, each one of these is a kilogram. So, I got 5, 6, and this is, well, this is almost a kilogram. So, it's a little over. But we're going to pass that around. That is the mass of the air exerted on. Where did it go? I have a little piece of paper. There it is. Okay. So I got out my ruler and did an inch by an inch. Okay. So basically, that area is. So one of the things when we study planets, like uh, planets where life might have evolved and stuff, we kind of think of um, the atmosphere and a player in how animals evolve actually is what is the pressure that they're evolving under. Um, Venus, oh my gosh, um, is it? We're about uh, about one atmosphere, um, and I think is it like I say two thousand times or something. Earth's pressure is what Venus is. So basically, you take two thousand times that, and that's what you feel like when you're on Venus. So life evolves differently. And I think I've seen like um, like NASA or you know the astrophysicists, astrobiologists talk about basically life would be really squished, you know, it'd be like centipedes. <laughs> I think that is so funny. Okay, so that's kind of a column of air, 14.7 pounds per square inch. Okay. So, but when we talk about pressure of the atmosphere, we don't usually talk about pounds per square inch. Of course, when you go to um, put air in your tire, you put like, like my mom the other day. She needed 30 PSI, pounds per square inch, in her car, tire, okay? So PSI stands for pounds per square inch. Okay. So that's kind of gases and, and the normal environmental pressure down here is 14.7 pounds per square inch. But switching gears to meteorology, if you guys have been doing your weather logs, okay, your weather logs have been reporting pressure in terms of inches. 
So you'll have like 29.8 29 inches, and that's your pressure. I'm going to talk about, really, it's inches of liquid mercury, but they usually just say inches. But switching gears even more, when we look at um, a, a map here of uh, what we call a surface map, those are actually going to be given in millibars, little MBs. So these numbers here of uh, 1,013 and 29.92, those are normal sea level pressures. Those would correspond about 14.7 pounds per square inch. Okay, now we're gonna th we're gonna change things up a bit, and the pressure isn't always doesn't always stay constant. Okay, so but that's kind of what air pressure is. So this is actually kind of side by side scales in inches. Like I said, these are the inches you've been reporting for your weather log. Now, one of the things you guys know, uh, probably between the English and metric system, is in the metric system, we have millimeters in the metric system and inches in the English system. Okay, so actually we're talking about the same device. Inches of mercury or millimeters of mercury right there. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, my bad. Millibars, MB. Remember I said at sea level we're about 100, or excuse me, 1,013 millibars? Okay, there we go. 1,013 millibars. Corresponds to 29.92 inches of mercury. So we, you know, we don't have to go up very high to have some crazy things happen. So, for instance, uh, highest sea level pressure ever recorded in the United States, 31.42. We run 29.92. To me, that's not a very big change. But if you're a meteorologist, you're like, whoa, dang, okay? That's like a crazy high pressure, okay? We could talk about low pressures, too. You know, um, this, I'll put an L here, and I'll put an H up here, because we're going to be talking about low pressures and high pressures. They're both players in weather. So if somebody says the pressure is running 28.94, you should say yikes. Even though you're like, oh, 29.92, that's normal sea level pressure, 28.84, 28.94, that's crazy. In order, like for instance, if you're into severe weather, like um, tornadoes and that sort of thing, they run around with a very low, uh, central low pressure. Scale up a tornado and then you have um, another sort of big cyclonic mo motion, you have your tropical cyclones or your hurricanes. Of course, they last longer than tornadoes. They're they affect more people. But anyway, they also have a very, in order to understand how intense your, your hurricane is, you look at how low the pressure is in the center, in the eye. Um, so it's important. So Hurricane Katrina, which we'll talk about, um, 26.71 was the low in the eye of the hurricane. So I brought along one gizmo okay, to measure uh, barometric pressure. But the two I want to talk about are the mercury barometer. Remember, I was talking about inches of mercury, um, the, the, the mercury barometer, and I also want to talk about the aneroid barometer. Anytime you see the word aneroid, think without air. Aneroid is without air. Okay, so starting, starting with the one that I didn't bring, a liquid mercury barometer. Actually, we have a periodic table over there, and mercury, as you guys probably know, is an element. The symbol for mercury is Hg. There are only two elements under uh, normal temperatures and pressures on the Earth that are liquids. That would be bromine and mercury. So what they do with mercury, I'll put this whole thing up here. What they do with mercury is kind of dangerous, because we used to play with liquid mercury. My bad. But if you've ever heard of Mad Hatter's disease, that's caused by people going crazy because of exposure to mercury. Um, so uh, what they do with uh, mercury is, uh, and it's, it does have a, a certain degree of volatility, but they have an open, they have an open pan of liquid mercury that's open to the environment. And then we have a glass tube that's closed up here. 
and basically we draw a vacuum on the glass tube, and then you put your finger on the end, and you set it in, down into the liquid mercury. Now, that's not how to do that, but that's how I picture it. So basically, that's absence of air up there. So that whole thing, that, that column of liquid mercury will kind of move up and down. It will respond basically to the pressure of the gas as it exerts on the open pan of liquid mercury. So as those arrows go increase, as the pressure of the atmosphere increase, as the air becomes more dense or just kicking around more because it's heated up more, um, then the, the amount will go up higher. So um, if we're under a high pressure event, then actually you're going to see if you're recording inches, your inches will increase. Okay. The inches of mercury. But they usually don't say of mercury, they say inches. So that is a liquid barometer. Kind of messy. Okay. And this is the one that I brought here today. So this is one that you might have at home or your folks have at home. My in-laws have passed away over the last couple of years, and one of the things I always admired was they had a, they had like three measuring devices on their wall, and this was one of them. <laughs> this is not adorable. I mean, this isn't theirs, but. Um, so this is an, an aneroid barometer. Now, you see the little gold thing? The little gold thing is, is movable, okay? So the, the, the way, reason you use the little gold thing is the black thing actually is responding to the pressure. And I'll go ahead and, can you guys see, I'm going to squeeze it just a little bit and you'll see the black thing go up. Okay, I've squeezed it too many times, okay, but you can kind of see it move. So actually that, this, this description talks about a flexible box and that's kind of, it's flexing to the atmosphere. Now it's a lot more sensitive than my guy did that. But you can already see the 30 and the 31, those are inches. And if you look up a little bit closer on the inside, it's centimeters of mercury. And then if you look on that inside track, that's millibars. So they go ahead and they give you all those scales right there, right then and there. So the thing about the gold thing is we would set it here to where it is. And then we would come back maybe in 12 hours or tomorrow morning. And if the black thing moved, if the, the one that's responding to the atmosphere moved, then actually we could get tendency, what's called tendency. And along the bottom here, Okay, I've kind of listed what you expect with tendency. Okay. If your tendency is for the pressure to get higher, that's what we call up. If your tendency is for the pressure to get higher, then actually you can think that high pressures usually bring clear skies, okay, warm temperatures, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, if your temperature, or excuse me, if your pressure is, is falling, if, the, if I come back later and my black arrow is down, I guess it would be over here. If it's falling, because that means it's getting smaller, okay, the pressure's getting less, then that actually means we're under the influence of low, and lows bring cloudy skies and perhaps precipitation. Okay. So, so actually kind of related to that, you can see on this old-timey, uh, it's old-timey looking, I just think it's classical looking. Okay. So over here, where we have high pressure, they've, they've gone fair skies. And over here, where we have low pressure, they've got, you know, rain and storm. That's kind of how that works. Yeah, I guess for this one, the inner track is millibars. Because you could find your 29.92, kind of hairyish, I don't know. and find uh, 1,013 millibars somewhere in there, too. All right, cool. So we're going to look at some weather maps here in a minute, some, some maps of the United States, what are called surface maps, because basically it's kind of maybe five feet off the surface what's going on with regard to things, in this case, pressure. But one of the things you guys would tell me, as you climb a mountain, the air gets thinner. Okay, as you climb a mountain, the air gets thinner. And actually, that's being shown here. I'm going to climb a mountain, go up, go up to Truckee, California, okay? And the pressure in millibars is not 1,013. The pressure in millibars is a, whack, a whopping 842. I go, down the, I go down the mountain, same day, different location, and I have a pressure of 1,008 millibars. 
Okay, it's denser down there, higher pressure. Well, the map I'm going to show you actually, when you look at a map of pressure, they go, they go ahead and they correct this guy. They have to correct for this location. Okay, why do they have to correct for that location? Because it's not fair to say that that particular location has such a low pressure because people will freak out. It's got a low pressure because it's a high elevation, so you have to correct for elevation in order to compare apples to apples. So what they do actually, and I'm not going to make you do this, but I'm just, you should kind of know how they do it. Um, basically what they do, and you can kind of see it down here, is they added back 180 millibars related to its, press, to, to its elevation. Okay, this one in between, okay, at Yosemite, Yosemite, is that really? I don't know. Okay, they actually, it was a, it was a lower elevation than the other one, and they only added back 120 millibars. So here on the, and, and we'll kind of finish that thought, here at this first location, notice that it was at sea level, so there was no adjustment required. Sometimes students will ask, well, Mrs. Snipes, what if it's below sea level? Do they add pressure? I would say yes. Okay. So these are the values that you're going to see on the map. Okay. So, yeah, I guess it still looks like this location at the far left has the highest pressure. Okay, but not by much. Definitely not by as much as that. Let's see. Because that's important because here in a minute we're going to talk about basically um, air moving from a high to a low pressure. It's important you do this correction. All right. So this is, I think we've looked at these before, just kind of in passing on the Internet. This is a contour map. You can see those contour lines. But they aren't connecting locations with the same temperature. They're connecting locations with the same pressure. Um, Air pressure and barometric pressure, environmental pressure, they're all the same thing, same pressure. So those contour lines are called isobars. So if anybody says isobars, they're talking about pressure, okay? It's really common to see um, kind of what we call the central low, central high, central low. It's really kind of common to see them kind of alternating like this. This is kind of a nice little pattern that we see sometimes. And do you see kind of the bullseye thing going on? The bullseye around the low. Now, high lows are great for nice, tight, pretty bullseyes. High highs have um, those contour lines that are spread apart more, and they don't. They aren't nice and round. Uh, central high pressure. If you ever needed to find out, for instance, um, what I'm trying to see. Wow, I was going to say I'm not sure I know what these lines are. I bet we could figure it out. It looks like the lines are going every four. So we have 1,008, 1,012, okay, 1,016 over here. So if this is 1,008, okay, this seems like it would be 1,004. This would be 1,000. See how it's stepping in? This would be 996. That's it. Does that make sense? So we kind of have a uh, low, uh, it kind of, we have a central low like that, and a central high like that. Now I'll give you a warning, and we'll see this later, it's not really a warning, but sometimes it looks like, um, you're like, man, I know that's a crazy pressure change, but look at those, look at the spacing of those lines. They look like they're far, well, if you look, sometimes they have changed the scale from four millibars to eight millibars. It's because it's so, you know, very um, quickly changing pressure. So that is an ISO, um, that is a map showing um, locations with the same pressure. Now, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you earlier than I have before to something called an isobaric chart or an isobaric map and try to describe what that is. Iso meaning the same, baric meaning the same, barometric pressure. This is a 500 millibar isobaric map, and I read in your text textbook recently, and this makes sense, let's see, 500 MBs, well, that's millibars. That's about half of 1,013, right? So we're at 1,013 millibars here, okay, 500 millibars here, okay, and then the rest of the atmosphere goes up. But remember, it's not linear or whatever, so it's not like halfway between the 
the, the ground and the end, edge of our atmosphere because it's more like exponential. So, But it's kind of halfway up with regard to um, mass. So what they did is they, they basically, these are contour lines now, are ISO heights. So you can see um, 5,760, okay, 5,640, 5,520, uh, 5,400. Those are elevations. Those, I think, are they kilometers? I think they are kilometers. Those are elevations that you need to go to in order to reach 500 millibars. That's it. So they're kind of similar to isobars, but they're a little bit different. Um, also, and this could be on either map, the, with the isobars or the isobaric map, um, you see these broad things called troughs and ridges. So um, later on in this unit, we're going to talk about if you can kind of see, can you kind of see a waviness here? Let's see if I can do it. See a waviness. Okay. That waviness actually, are, they're called Rossby waves, kind of the kind of the wave, the gentle, general deal of how our atmosphere is, especially up at upper elevations. The troughs actually are associated with low pressures, and the ridges are associated with high pressures. Okay, so we'll be talking more about that. All right. So vertical, you guys buy this. This is vertical, and this is horizontal. Okay, so vertical differences in pressure. All right, we've been talking about that for a while. So vertical differences in pressure. That's why when you climb a mountain, the air gets thinner. It's not why, but it's the reality of it. So when you climb a mountain, the air gets thinner. Okay, it's like this one over here. Okay, you come down to the Earth's surface, it's like this one. Okay, remember I said you can kind of think of pressure is a couple different ways. Basically, the weight of the air over your head and also kind of how the pressure particles are bouncing against you. So this is, again, this is a figure from your textbook. That other one wasn't from your textbook. But this is showing you how as you go up in elevation, the air gets thinner. At the Earth's surface, the air is the thickest. It's the most dense. It's the highest pressure. And so I kind of like this one because it's showing you um, with elevation what the approximate pressure would be. So that 500 millibar isobaric map that we looked at a minute ago, it would be right about here. So it's definitely not halfway between the Earth's surface and the top of, the, of our atmosphere. All right. So that's what we call a vertical pressure difference. I'm going to go ahead, before we leave this slide, I'm going to put the letter L up here for a low pressure. I'm going to put the letter H down here for a high pressure. So everywhere, kind of vertically speaking, we have this difference in pressure from high to low. Okay, so that was a vertical difference. Now, that wasn't, our weather map doesn't talk about vertical differences that we looked at before. Our weather, our, the map the, with the isobars that we looked at a minute ago talks about differences between on the surface. There's a high pressure over here and there's a low pressure over here on the surface. How does that happen, right? How does that happen? So there's a three ways that you can get on the Earth's surface a high and a low. We'll talk about them and we'll kind of see them in action. One is temperature. So in general, if you have warm air, and I can almost see this, if you have warm air, and of course warm air is depicted over here by the red, you generally have a lower pressure. Okay? And I, I can see that, because can you almost see... You know, if we take a snapshot of this down here, it's a lower pressure. Well, they're moving faster because they're warmer, but they're more spread out. It's, it's, it's less dense. It's a lower pressure. Okay, if we compare that to cold air, okay, cold air, 
as down here. They're closer together. I've had students tell me before it's almost like they want to huddle together because they're so cold. Okay, so actually, as they are kind of collectively huddled together, they have they're very dense. They create what we call they create a high pressure. Okay, so that right in and of itself, and um, I think I mentioned this last week. We had that really crazy wind event. I thought by last Thursday, but anytime, anytime uh, here in the Midwest, it rolls past us that we have a nice warm day, and then it's cold the next day. You're going to see. If it's a drastic change in temperature, you're going to see a crazy wind associated with it. And we're going to talk about why wind comes from the differences in pressures. Okay, so that's one way to get a difference in, in pressures. The other way is moisture, is water vapor content. So here's where there's some things in science where you have to say it's kind of backwards from what you think. And this is one of them. Because if I were to ask most people if the air is really humid, you know, you think oh, it's really dense because I can't breathe and there's probably a reason, a physiological reason for that. But honestly, if you have high humidity, okay, actually that's a lower pressure. It, generally speaking, you're under that, that, that chunk of air that you're, uh, that's very humid at a low pressure. And the reason can be thought of because actually a water molecule okay, weighs less than um, the normal nitrogen and even oxygen, okay? So actually, that is kind of at the crux of why we, we have a low pressure, okay? So dry air is going to have a high pressure. All right, so that's a difference. And the last one is moving air moving towards a common spot or moving away from a common spot. So we'll be talking more about moving air, but I'll just tell you that diverging air looks like this. Um, let's see, I'll start with converging air because that's the funnest. I think we've talked about convergence as a lifting mechanism. So converging air, I remember I think I might have said you throw um, candy into a, a playground, a crowded playground, Okay, and you're going to basically see um, kids converge. Okay, so kids converge right there. That's convergence. And can you almost see where actually that creates a high pressure? So convergence creates a high pressure. And then, I don't think I had to talk about this before, but <laughs> let's just say on the playground again, they eat a lot of candy, and one kid throws up. So this is that kid's vomit. <laughs> That's terrible. Okay. So if he throws up, then what's going to happen? Well, everybody's <laughs> going to leave, except for the adults who have to clean it up. Okay. So actually, we have a divergence of, of kids there. We can have a divergence of air. And then what that will leave behind actually is a low pressure where divergence occurs. Okay. So that's another way. Converging air creates a high. Diverging air creates a low. Uh, so that's that. Okay. So those are, those are all ways that at the same elevation we can actually have differences in pressure. Those are horizontal differences. Now, the reason we care about differences in pressure, okay, is because we're leading up to what is wind. What, why does wind occur? Okay. And wind is just air moving, and the reason it's moving is because it's moving from a high to a low pressure. That's it. Okay, so um, here we go. We have a high pressure here. We have a low pressure here. It kind of looks like a football field. Okay, notice that the pressure is in millibars. We can see it getting lower and lower and lower. Okay, so um, we call it a pressure gradient force. Okay, pressure gradient force. Um, I'm going to go ahead and abbreviate pressure gradient force. I'm going to call that the PGF. There's our first of a few kind of acronyms. PGF, pressure gradient force. Basically, it just means that you have a high pressure and a low pressure, and you have the potential for air to relocate from a high to a low pressure. Sometimes I think of it like as in, um, especially here, I don't know if, um, what's across the river with the lower gas prices? Do they still 
have start the letter A, right? It takes 61 going south. No, it's not a get. It's a little town. Alexandria. Thank you, <laughs> Alexandria. I don't know if it still has lower gas prices than Keokuk. Do. do they? Okay. They do, and you have to weigh gauge. You know, pun intended, whether it's worth it going that extra. But so, yeah. See, that's significant. I thought they did, and they sell fireworks too, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, um, not the fireworks, but I kind of think of it like this, that, that higher prices kind of drive us to where it's lower prices if we could. So, that's kind of like a, a gradient going from high to low. Um, and then we also have um, kind of the spacings of the, of the isobars. Those, those hash marks are isobars because they're locations with the same pressure. So, the fact that um, these are closer, do you, I don't know if you buy that these are closer together, than these, okay? So actually, this is a stronger force. This is a stronger gradient, and it will create stronger winds. So, so now I brought some, um, th some things to kind of think about pressure creating wind here. So this is a turkey baser. So as you squeeze in on this, okay, of course, you create a wind, okay? So like, Gets the wind. Cut your hand. Do it. Beep. So what's happening is I'm squeezing this. I'm creating a high pressure in there. It's just air relocating. It's going from a high to a low. Okay, like that. All right. Um, here's another one. All right. So. So there's really low pressure in there. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put more air in there. Increase the pressure. Okay. Increase the pressure. Pressure. Yeah. Now, what happens if I let go of this? What's the air inside going to do? Relocate to the outside. It's going to relocate to the outside, exactly. Higher pressure, lower pressure. In the meantime, in doing so, it's like one of Newton's second laws. For every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. Okay, so there you go. Cool. I think that probably does it. Okay. So, the surface map we saw a little bit ago with those isobars and the trough and ridges. Okay. So um, at the end of the diagram, we saw the figure in the previous slide where they were closer together. That was a steep pressure gradient. It would create stronger winds. And it's kind of similar to when we had a steep temperature change, temperature gradient. So. Okay. Well, when we get up to e upper elevations, you're going to see kind of like the hash marks we saw a minute ago, that basically the isobars is straight lines. You're going to kind of see that. But usually at the Earth's surface, it's more wavy. So do you recognize, uh, uh, we kind of talked about uh, on the previous map, we kind of had a central low with a bullseye. Okay, and here we're showing a central high with a bullseye. Usually the high pressures aren't that nice of a bullseye. Okay, but they're circular. And why is there a high and why is there a low? Well, there could have been anything. It could have been from convergence and divergence. It could have been temperature difference. Uh, what was the other one looked at? Moisture difference, okay, creating those. All right. So here is another surface map, um, and we can see the isobars. And this one kind of emphasizes, you guys hopefully would tell me that over here, okay, the fact that those isobars are so close together, 
you think that you don't have to go very far to get a difference in pressure. If I were to blow up two balloons, one balloon was kind of wimpy, and one balloon I kicked up the pressure in it, if I were to let them go and create the wind, the one that had a greater pressure difference from the atmosphere would have more force. And the one that was just barely would just go okay. So this one is a strong change over not very much, and this one is a little bit weaker. So what this map has added to it is the more is it has, it basically has wind speed. So the more flags you get, the more the wind. Okay, the fewer flags you have, the weaker the wind. Okay, so can you kind of look now at, uh, uh, look over here and kind of see around the high, we kind of have wimpy flags. Okay, and around the low, we have not so wimpy flags. Okay, so start kind of thinking along those lines. Okay. So, in Chapter 7, I believe it's in Chapter 7, we'll be talking about different scales of winds, like little winds, big winds, um, that sort of thing, humongous winds. Uh, and one of the types of winds we'll talk about are, are called the local winds. Okay. So, one of the local winds is actually called a sea breeze. And if you've ever been to, um, let's see if I can put this whole thing up there, can I? If you've ever been to Chicago... This sea breeze I'm describing actually is the lake breeze that they get off of Lake Michigan. Um, and about 3 p.m., um, they basically can, out of nowhere, especially on a sunny day, get a wind coming into the city. And it's aggravated, and I don't talk about this much, but it's aggravated because of the skyscrapers, and they create these kind of just narrow passages for that wind to flow through, and it's called gap winds. So basically you have that wind tunneling through those skyscrapers, okay? Um, but it's created by Lake Michigan, very similar to what we, uh, we call sea breezes that you would get along the coast. Um, so sea breezes have to do with temperature, because we said that warm air has a relatively low pressure and cold air has a high pressure. That's exactly what's the crooks of sea breeze or the lake breeze over Chicago. So um, the other thing we talked about in, I can't remember, maybe it was chapter two, we talked about, um, maybe three, that large bodies of water are slow to heat and slow to cool. And so actually large bodies of water, whether that's an ocean um, or whether that's Lake Michigan, are slow to heat and slow to cool. And so that's where you're going to get your temperature difference. So I like this figure. I prefer this figure to the figure that's in your textbook now. So um, it, it goes like this. You kind of start with the top one. Okay. So this is actually, um, I'll go ahead and put 6 a.m. up there. Okay, see the moon. The sun's going to come up soon. This could be, I don't know, you know, 8 a.m. And then this could be like 2 p.m., something like that. Okay, the sun's rising. So, um, now, as the sun first starts to rise, okay, we said that land will heat up quickly, okay, and that actually the oceans will generally be cool, okay, because they're stubborn to heat up. So, um, that land gets nice and toasty, then about 2 p.m., actually, we have nice and warm conditions here creating our low pressure. So the sea breeze or the lake breeze looks like this. Basically, Lake Michigan or the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean is still pretty cool out here. And cool things, cool air actually is a relatively high pressure. So we have a push from Lake Michigan or from the oceans towards the land. Okay. Now these local breezes, these local winds like, like the lake, lake breeze, you know what direction they're coming from by the name right before wind or, or breeze. So when we call it a sea breeze or a lake breeze, it's coming from the lake or the sea. Okay, so that's it. And then um, folks in Chicago have something to look forward to in the evening because we have the, an outgoing breeze in the evening off of the Great Lakes and um, oceans. 
And it's just the opposite because actually by then, okay, the oceans have been, um, oops, it's kind of, by then the, the oceans are on this side. The oceans are still kind of toasty. They're still kind of warm. They retain their heat that they got during the daytime. And in, be, in being that way, they have a relatively low pressure out here. Um, your land cools quickly. And so we have a high pressure here because it's cooler. And now we have an outgoing breeze. So that's kind of cool. And so we have, they kind of go together. We have the sea and the land breeze, kind of sea breeze at 2 p.m. and the land breeze in the evening. All right. I'll let you write down what's on the slide, but I think we're going to take a running start at this topic of the Coriolis Force next week. Okay. Very good.